with Ben Killam, who has worked extensively and well published around black bears and uh, has some perhaps different points of view than some of our previous presenters from DEC and so forth. So anyway, that's a uh, should be a really great program. So today, I think you all know why why you're here. Uh, Bernard Drew, who is going to tell us a couple of stories about uh, electrification and uh, the history, some of the history of it in our region, uh, both Barrington and Salisbury. Um, I know a lot of you are familiar with him. Uh, he is resident of Great Barrington. He was uh, for years senior associate editor of Lakeville Journal newspapers. He's a charter member of the Upper Housatonic Valley National Heritage Area. He's been a newspaper columnist, wrote a column for dozens of years. Um, he's written, and he is the town historian for Great Barrington, and, but he knows a lot of history beyond just Great Barrington and has written quite a few books. So, um, so welcome, Bernie. Hello. And Bernie's connection is not to... standing, so listen well. Go ahead. Um, I'd like, like to dedicate my remarks today to the late Ed Kirby of Sharon, who was a longtime friend and an excellent resource for just the types of particularly in industrial history that, that appealed to me. I'm going to relate two stories, one about the origins of um, more, some of the origins of alternating current electricity and then later um, what the growing need for that electricity meant to some of the residents, particularly in Sheffield. So I start with William Stanley Jr. He lived from 1858 until 1916. He was born in Brooklyn, New York, but he, is, he had family connections in Great Barrington. What do you call it? The grandmother was a um, innkeeper program. here for a number of years on Main Street. Four o'clock program. Sorry. See you later. No, no. No, I'm not going to bother you. Just... Somebody needs to mute, please. Um, Stanley attended college for a brief period and he found he just he wasn't learning what he, he wanted to learn, so he left. And he started working for Swan Electric in Eastern Massachusetts. And he worked uh, in, in the early 1880s. Everybody was trying to improve the light bulb, the first use that they could find for electricity was in, in lighting offices, stores, homes, and particularly factories so that um, safe conditions could continue through the nighttime and paper mills, uh, textile mills could have uh, laborers working th throughout 24 hour period. Um, Stanley's father was a lawyer and bought a, a, call it a retirement home on the main street in Great Barrington. It was next, next to the um, congregational church. So William Stanley joined Union Switch and Signal. This is one of many subsidiaries of George Westinghouse's vast industrial complex. And while there, Stanley um, became fascinated by alternating current. There, the general mode of electricity used at the time was direct current. And don't ask me to explain the difference between the two. I don't know a whole lot about electricity, but Thomas Edison was supporting direct current and to produce that, and you know, it was in use already in the early 1880s in New York City and other cities. And there would be a power plant you know, located, it looked like a, one of the city blocks and it would send out electricity. The difficulty with direct current was it could only go one or two blocks um, before it needed gigantic wires. And, and it, that was a, a stumbling block to widespread 
transmission of, of electricity. Alternating current, on the other hand, could be uh, transmitted over longer, much longer distances. And William Stanley was one of many inventors, electricians, electronic specialists working at the time. He acquired <clears throat> from France a Gillard Gibbs alternating current transformer. And he tinkered and he went to George Westinghouse with an idea. He said, you know, if you sponsor me, I would like to work on this and, and come up with a system to, to transmit alternating current power over long distances. Stanley did not want to stay in Pittsburgh at the time, both he didn't like the working conditions, but he also did not like the air. He was in early stages suffering tuberculosis, which is what ultimately took his life a couple of decades later. So George Westinghouse gave the nod, Stanley brought his wife and family to Great Barrington and he rented an abandoned rubberware factory. Now I'm gonna change gears a little bit from electricity to water power. And I wanna talk about that factory because it'll, it'll come around, it'll circle around to the second part of the, this program. He leased the, the old rubberware factory put up in the 1850s by Horace Day. Horace Day, <clears throat> um, modified, adapted, took over the process of, of, you know, taking rubber from rubber trees, rubber sap, processing it. And he, um, that was developed by Charles Goodyear. And Horace Day had a, an extended building in Great Barrington. The foundation is still there along the Housatonic River, just off of Cottage Street. And you can see the foundation from Great Barrington River Walk, which is a section of uh, trail along, along the Housatonic to the rear of St. Peter's Catholic Church. Horace Day produced such things as rubberized fire buckets and boots and rain gear. And he was modestly successful. He kept enlarging his factory, but he needed power to run some of his equipment. Now he built his factory and utilized an old water privilege that had gone with a grist mill. And the grist mill did not need a lot of power. Well, Day needed a lot more power. And the way water power is derived from what they call the drop. If, in other words, you know how far down the water falls to spin a water wheel or a turbine. And the dam that he was using behind St. Peter's Church um, was insufficient. So he just arbitrarily had the dam elevated two feet, which was fine. And then he had sufficient power. Unfortunately, by elevating the level of the dam, it backed the water up to a higher level and about a, a third of a mile upstream near, near the Great Bridge in Great Barrington, the Route 7 Bridge um, was the Russell Textile Factory. And the backed up water impeded the turning of their two water wheels. And it really put the jam on their production of textiles. So, Carly Russell and a couple of the, um, a number of his workers, um, I don't know if it's daytime or nighttime, but at, at any rate, they descended on Horace Day's dam and with pick and ax and every tool they could, they uh, knocked off the two feet elevation to that dam. And well, that caused quite a hullabaloo, but ultimately Horace Day did not prevail. And he was a bit of a dubious character anyway, even though he used Goodyear's rubber patent, he never paid a cent of royalty and he was not a popular man. And so this, his factory, he'd put it up 1850, by the middle, middle of the 1850s, despite some large scale plans for a, a residential development. So he, had, he could have laborers living nearby. He just packed up and moved away. And just to quickly end this story, he ended up out at Niagara Falls, where he got 
backing and he constructed a water power canal from the top of the Canadian Falls um, inland slightly and the water exiting out below the American Falls. And the intent was to, su to supply energy. You know, he would, he would bring in various industries and they would pay subscription and, and use the, utilize his water from the canal. Um, that again, did not, ended up not attracting many, many users. The plan did not succeed. Anyway, <clears throat> his factory building in Great Barrington sat abandoned and William Stanley coming, came into town with, with a contract in hand. He had a two year contract um, for $4,000 plus a $600 a month to support his, his laboratory. And this, this is how one of, I'll read from uh, a description by Stanley himself. We packed up our few belongings, shook the dirt of the dreadful Pittsburgh from us and hastened to the green hills of the Berkshires to build a laboratory and succeed or perish at our work. He soon brought in um, one of the Gallard Gibbs transformer and dismantled it and put it back together the way he thought it should be assembled. He also had a Simmons dynameter and tan tangent gal galvanometer and two Cardan voltmeters. I don't begin to know what they were all used for, but he, he had a well-equipped um, laboratory. And he, within six months, he had a working de device, but then he, he needed to be able to dis demonstrate it to George Westinghouse and O.B. Schallenberger and others uh, from Pittsburgh. So Stanley had a couple of laboratory assistants. Louis Leffert Jenkins was one and Reginald Belfield, an Englishman, was another. And these two men, with some help from some Stanley relatives in town, strung wire across the Housatonic River up onto Main Street past the Congregational Church to a few buildings there and did a dry run. I'll give you the date of that. It was on 6th of March, 1886. And then he put on a public demonstration the 20th of March, 1886. Everything worked fine. So it was time to send for George Westinghouse. Now I'm going to tell you another aside. It's simultaneous with Stanley's coming to Great Barrington, there was a woman by the name of Mary Frances Sherwood Hopkins. She lived from 1819 to 1891. She was the widow of Mark Hopkins of Central Pacific Railroad. She had, let's just say she had very deep pockets. She had a home, a lavish home in San Francisco but she also had family connections, Hopkins, Kellogg's and others in Great Barrington. And she wanted to, to build a new place back, back in New England. And she inherited land from um, you know, some of her aunts. And it was land, if you're familiar with Great Barrington, um, that much, much of that land is behind a stone wall today. It's John Dewey Academy, better known as Cyril's Castle. In Mrs. Hopkins' day, she called it Kellogg Terrace. She owned, on the other side of the river, she owned a quarry. She constructed a small quarry railroad and brought uh, blue dolomite from the mountain, East Mountain, down for the construction of her new mansion. And construction went along a pace, and by 1885, you know, they're starting to, to do some interior work. In 1886, she wants to have lights in her new home. And so her superintendent, a man named H.N. Bodwell, installed a direct current system. The power generator initially was on Main Street. It later uh, was moved into the basement of the house. And when actually uh, Mrs. Hopkins and others were living inside, running the DC system was so loud that they couldn't hear any of the chamber music in the music room. So an, an outbuilding was constructed a few years, you know, later, a year or so later uh, for the DC power plant. Anyway, the DC system 
was up and running and there was going to be surplus power. So Bodwell recruited a few uh, store owners and office holders and such on Main Street and ran wires to those buildings. And he put his system into work on the 10th of March, 1886. So it was, it was within days of Stanley powering the north end of Main Street with alternating current. Bodwell is powering the south end of Main Street with direct current. When during the public, Stanley's public demonstration, one could walk up and down Main Street and view all of the lights. They only powered lights in store entryways and store windows and in offices. They, they did not power street lamps. The town already had street lamp system. It was powered by coal gas. So they were looking at light bulbs in, in these store windows and they, they couldn't tell the difference. Why? Because everybody used the same bulb, whether it was DC or AC. And it all looked pretty much the same. So on the 16th of April, 1886, George Westinghouse, his brother H.H. H. Westinghouse, Franklin L. Pope, and Guido Pantaleone came from Pittsburgh for a demonstration. They were suitably impressed um, and, and gave, you know, congratulated Stanley on his good work and went home again. Um, Stanley stayed in Great Barrington, uh, continued to work in his laboratory for a time. He described what he had done this way. He said, the plant was operated every night. The engine felt like it from April 6 to June 16, when an attendant dropped a screwdriver in the alternator and wrecked it. During the two months operation, we had but one electrical trouble. On a wet night, a leak from a, our 500 primary set fire to, or rather smoked the side of, out of the shed. No damage was done. A great sense of relief came over me when I realized that I was not obliged to start that engine again because of the screwdriver. So Stanley and his cousin Ralph Taylor took off to fish in the Saguenay River in Quebec, a deserved vacation. We have a few pictures to, to show you. Um, just first, I want to hold up so you can see. This is a Stanley transformer. This is my Stanley transformer. It says, it's a scale model made in 1911 when American Institute of Electrical Engineers held its annual meeting in Pittsfield with some functions in Great Barrington. Sort of ironically, um, one of the sessions was held at Kellogg Terrace, um, 1911. By then, they probably have switched alternating current. I'm not sure. Could I have the, some of the slides I sent in? Sure. I think. We'll try this. This first image is the old. Hang on, there we there we go. Uh, Horace Day Rubberware Factory. Um, that yep, yeah, that looks like it. This is William Stanley himself, handsome man. Um, I'll tell you a little bit to, to to the rest of his story in a minute. Bernie, which, which slide do you want up there? Get the third image? Yeah, that's, it's, there we go. I think it gets um, a little slower. That, that one's good. This is um, Stanley. Made, um, he said, we, we built in all at the Great Barrington factory, 26 transformers, 10 of which were sent to Pittsburgh to be used in a demonstration. The transformers in the village lit 13 stores, two hotels, two doctor's offices, one barber shop, and the telephone and post office.
there's, a, I'm given to understand one of the transformers is in the Ford Museum. The transformer you see here um, is one, it was a lot of fun to handle the thing that was, is in the Berkshire Museum collection in Pittsfield. Um, it's a full scale, full size replica. It's the best I can, you know, people have tried to research this. Is it a real one? Is it a replica made by the uh, model shop at General Electric? And the consensus seems to be that it's a replica. Nevertheless, it gives a, a real good uh, indication of what the things looked like. And just to the rear of it um, is a Stanley bottle, which is what I'll talk about next. So you can take down the pictures, please. Stanley wasn't through demonstrating alternating currents potential. Um, he filed for and received US patent number 349611 on September 21st, 1886. He moved to Pittsfield in 1891, found financial backing and established Stanley Electric firm in, in that city and with, with others in partnership, manuf they began manufacture of SKC transformers, Stanley Kelman Chesney transformers, um, and found a good market for them. And they began to add other products. The trouble Stanley had was he was very good as an electrical engineer. He was not so great as a financial person. He, the business, um, had a hard time making making money. In 1893, I would point out, this is two years before Nikola Tesla demonstrated a more spectacular system at Niagara Falls. In 1893, Stanley set up a power generating system at the old Alger Iron Furnace on the Housatonic River in Stockbridge, just above Housatonic Village. This was the this, this site of the old Alger iron furnace. Um, but Stanley put up a new stone building and, and improved the dam and put up a power generating station. And it was here that electricity from 240 watt Stanley Kelman Chesney transformer shot through a mile long wire of electricity 1000 uh, into the village of Housatonic to Monument Mills for lighting inside the factory. And that powered 1000 incandescent lights, 20 arc lights, two 40 horsepower motors. The wires then continued on another seven and a half miles into Great Barrington to serve residential customers. A second 270 kilowatt generator was put in in 1898, both generators were two phase 66 cycle induction units wound for 2400 volts, according to Electrical World. And I only throw that out there for those who understand electricity. Um, Monument Mills later built a larger hydro generating plant two or three miles upstream in, that, in 1906, and that plant is still functioning. Stanley sold his building and that factory evolved into General Electric. Stanley re returned to Great Barrington in 1885, found backing and established a new factory, this time making initially watt hour meters. I don't have a watt hour meter, but this is the, the, the dial configuration from one of the meters. It looks very much like the watt hour meter that's probably on the side of your house today. Same sort of uh, function. The trouble is George Westinghouse was also making watt hour meters at the same time. And he sued Stanley. And after a bit of a court case, um, Stanley lost. He couldn't make watt hour meters any longer. So he did a um, contract with General Electric and had a laboratory 
at the foot of Church Street in Great Barrington. And there did work on such things as electric cooking ranges for kitchens. Um, now that they could get electricity out to homes, they needed products to sell to consumers so that they could use the electricity. In experimenting with insulating a kitchen range, Stanley came up with a discovery of a welding technique in which he could have two layers of metal and a hollow space in between. He adapted this into, you can see it, I'll hold it back a little further, um, a thermos type bottle, all metal, and began to manufacture them in Great Barrington. This is, um, I have about 30 of them in the basement. People like to give them to me. This is a pint size. They come in quarts, gallons. They come in carafes. They come in pitchers. They come in all sorts of things. The, um, what Stanley developed was a, a welding system for the seams and a seam here. And in between two layers of metal um, is bone meal. And the inside of the, the bottle itself is enameled. On uh, the foot of uh, Church Street is, is River Street. One of the buildings there is now owned by a paper company. That's the last remaining of Stanley's uh, industrial buildings. That was the old enameling room. So Stanley continued as long as his health allowed. He enjoyed hunting. He um, dabbled in real estate. He owned a, a number of uh, residential properties in town. One was on Maple Avenue, now gone. Another was where Eisner Camp Institute is today. Um, and when he owned that property, he suffered, there was a fire in, in the uh, mansion. He rebuilt and he rebuilt using a lot of stone and the stone walls are 18 to 24 inches thick. Um, he wasn't gonna fool around with fire uh, chance of fire anymore. So now we have established the viability of alternating current electricity. There's a an intense but not enormously long battle between um, the Edison direct current interests and the Westinghouse alternating current interests and Westinghouse prevailed. This story is told in a, you see it, a motion picture that came out a couple of years ago, the current wars. And in it, um, actors portray Edison and they portray Westinghouse and they portray Tesla. Uh, Stanley is conveniently left out, though there is a brief scene in there where um, the electricians come to Great Barrington and, and conduct their experiment. They kind of merge Stanley into the character of Frank Pope and a couple of others um, to, to skip through that part of the story. I, I just assume they spent more time on Stanley myself. But it's an interesting story. If you watch the movie, it helps if you have a clue of what, what the electricity battle was all about because they're, they're a little you know, slow in telling us. Let's jump ahead to 1905. Alternating current um, is dominant. However, how do you get electricity from a source to factories doors, um, offices, homes, schools, and the like. Well, you put up an electric generating station and how are they powered? You, in, initially by hydropower. Now I have to tell you about the main character of our next segment, John Henry Rohrbach, who lived for many years in North Canaan. He was called Boss Rohrbach for his enormous sway in Connecticut state politics. Well, Rohrbeck um, 
grew up in Sheffield. His father, James Rohrbeck, had a, a um, 185-acre farm at the corner of Boardman Street and Covered Bridge Lane in that town. And as a boy, this, this story comes from the Springfield Republican. As a boy, he played with toy dams and miniature water wheels near his home in Sheffield, a town in the lower Berkshires. Years after he had scaled the heights, Rohrbeck took a party of close friends back to the scene of his boyhood and walked over a knoll overlooking a brook and said, you can see some of the rocks piled in that brook where I made my first dam. That's where my interest in water power developed. Well, his interest certainly did develop. Um, he taught school for a while. He, he uh, obtained a law degree. He flirted with industry, became active in politics. He was legal counsel to the New York, New Haven, Hartford Railroad in 1898. He became a political lobbyist and he sought public office. At the time, North Canaan Village was supplied with alternating current electricity from a small generating station in Norfolk. One day the lights went out. The townspeople were disappointed in the system's unreliability. Having some savings in the bank and with a few backers, Rohrbeck acquired the small utility. Now he could build real dams, not just ones on his backyard streams. He incorporated Berkshire Power Company in 1905 with capital stock of $240,000. And the intent was to install an electric power generating plant in North Canaan. A large storage reservoir would be constructed. Now, when I I'll give the address North Canaan, it was on the Housatonic River. So it was North Canaan on one side and the Weetog section of Salisbury on the other side. In late, I'm reading again from the newspaper, in late 19, December 1904, work was commenced on a dam and powerhouse on the Housatonic River at a point above one and one half miles below the village of North Canaan. And the work was as far completed that in the following September, current was supplied to the lines of the old Norfolk Company. It was not, however, until the winter of 1906 that the transmission line to Sharon was finally connected and the complete territory served from the new central powerhouse. This information has come from a, a, a trade journal, Electrical Review. At the place selected for the powerhouse, the Housatonic River made a fall of about four feet as it passed under a toll bridge carrying the highway from North Canaan to Twin Lakes. If you go up Weetog Road, you will pass under one of the abutments to this old toll road. So the uh, power station itself was across the river, not where the road is a little bit away. It was on Gordon Whitbeck and uh, Elvia Genoa's um, Weetog Farm property. The dam itself, 98 feet long of solid concrete resting on a ledge at the bottom of the river extends from one bridge pier to the other and with flashboards three feet high creates a total hydraulic head of 12 feet. To the west of the west pier, three waste gates each eight by 10 feet are set in concrete masonry and form the west abutment for the bridge. On the east side, two concrete arches spring from the bridge pier to the rock bank of the river and carry the roadway over the entrance chamber head race. Obviously the Housatonic River by the time it's crossed the Connecticut border has become much wider than it is in Great Barrington. And so this dam is much wider and more ambitious than Horace Day's old dam. There was a, the generating station was housed in a brick building and it initially contained a generator with a 325 kilowatt capacity. There soon, as soon as it went online, there, um, it became a major issue, not with the electricity, but with the water. The high dam, higher dam, again, than it had been there previously, um, flooded farmlands upstream. 
if you you ever canoed the Housatonic River anywhere in Sheffield, you have to work pretty hard because the the terrain is very level there. There's not much of a free ride. Um, that's why Sheffield is such a strong agricultural community. It has a lot of rich farmland along the river. Well, when this dam was put up and went into service, it flooded water upstream in Connecticut past Bartholomew's Cobble, past the middle of Sheffield, all, all the way up to the upper covered bridge at Kellogg Road. And it flooded significantly. Farmers who had been accustomed to, you know, putting their cattle out to pasture or to, to harvesting crops near the river um, were pushed back and pushed back. And they were not happy. Um, a lot went on. The power, you, you know, Roarback's power utility negotiated and paid damages to a good number of property owners. Um, the dam was perfectly legal as far as Roarback and as far as Connecticut were concerned. That's, that state legislature had um, passed a joint resolution in 1905 authorizing the erection of the dam and the, the taking of land flooded. So they expect us you know, to have to pay some property owners for the damages done. Um, but some of the farmers in Sheffield didn't want money, they wanted their land back. And so a case of Myer, Myron W. Andrus versus Berkshire Power Company, there were two other litigants, um, went to United States Circuit Court of Appeals with their case and a trial was held that the judge refused to grant an injunction. The, Mr. Andrus took this appeal from Judge Platt to the next level of court and again, you know, attempted to, to present their case and get the dam lowered. This, um, resulted in actually three simultaneous cases. Andrus um, brought his own charges against Berkshire Power, uh, John Griffith also, and Patrick Hughes. Andrus farmed on Ranapo Road in Ashley Falls. Griffith farmed in Chapinville, on Chapinville Road rather in Sheffield. And Hughes farmed on the east side of the river close to the center of Sheffield. Again, the uh, judge heard their testimony, but found no basis for the complaint about the master and said he was satisfied that the amount of which he placed the damages in each case is substantially right, and I shall accept it as the basis of my finding. The crux of the matter was they said that these farmers had in fact sat down with Rohrbach representatives and, and the appear, made the appearance of negotiating for a settlement if they had not done this, they might have had a much stronger case and might have prevailed. So what do they do? The farmers are without all their prime land. The Massachusetts legislature took an interest and the attorney general, knows, now time has crept on to 1910, authorized, you know, authorized the Massachusetts Harbor and Land Commission to investigate and make a study. The commission, you know, initially, you know, quick survey found what everybody suspected. Yes, there's been flooding here. Um, but to come up with more detailed evidence, they needed to, to map the damage. And that would cost about an upwards of $3,000. And as, as much as the legislation or the authority for this um, study had been passed without any funding, uh, they could take, couldn't take it a step further. So that meant another year. In 1912, the legislature again authorized the Harbor and Land Commission to send a survey crew to Sheffield and to map out exactly how much damage had been done. This time the commission surveyed and plotted the flooded section of Sheffield from the Connecticut border to the upper covered bridge with an eye on determining 
how the banks had changed. The resolve also provided that a copy of the survey be prepared and deposited in the South Berkshire Registry of Deeds and that, that it or an attested copy shall be com competent evidence in any judicial proceeding. Um, I'd like to show the pictures now, please. Uh, that's that's Foss Rohrbach in his later years. This is what the power plant looked like at high water. Uh, as you can see, there's a, a steel bridge across the dam, so they could add access to either Salisbury or to Canaan. Now, when I read what I just told you about there, there being a copy of their map in the Registry of Deeds, I went to our office here in Great Barrington and inquired because I couldn't find any of the books. Well, the registrar said, wait a minute. She went in the back room and, and brought out this roll in the next picture. Um, it's cropped a little bit. There are people on either side of that. That measures about four by 10 feet um, with the Connecticut line on the left, I guess, and um, covered bridge on the right. At any rate, um, it was, it was inc remarkably difficult for the surveyors to de determine where the old riverbank levels were. And in their report, they determined that, you know, the, the land was also subject to routine spring runoff and flooding. So the farmers each, each spring might experience a month of high water and then the water would go down and they could put their cattle out or, or raise their crops. The, this is a, one of the more fascinating maps I've ever seen. The Housatonic River, to go from the Connecticut line to the upper cover bridge, if you were a crow, it would be about five and a half miles. But if you were on the river, it'd be about 12 and a half miles with all sorts of meanders and nooks and oxbows and the like. The farmers who brought this case to court were not happy with the map and with the results because they didn't want a determination to be based on spring flooding. They wanted it to be based on where, you know, the summer flow of, of water and um, what they were used to having. If you're familiar with Bartholomew's Cobble and you go, go to the visitor center and you go fairly immediately out to the river, you can see a, an oxbow there. When I was there, my wife and I were there last year, um, there, was, there were cattle out there pasture. Well, that would all have been underwater and the water would have been quite high up toward the one of the hiking trails and, and uh, Bartholomew's cobble. Okay, you can take the picture down, please. So the result was no result, no satisfaction for the farmers. The court focused more on historical or seasonal flooding than perpetual um, flooding caused by this new dam. The Berkshire Courier reporter in 1913 said the um, Board of Selectmen in town were also dissatisfied because they had had to spend some $2,000 of the state's money um, to have this map prepared. Not to mention the town out of its pocket paid $12 for dinners for the Harbor Commission surveyors um, while they were out here. A week later, heavy snow melt and rainfall increased the flooding of low-lying areas, east, west, middle roads to Great Barrington underwater. The flooding uh, on one occasion heavily damaged the abutments of the lower Sheffield covered bridge. And 
the town uh, sued and got damages and, and was able to repair that that expense. So Rohrbeck um, has a small utility on his hands. He uh, pretty soon sells his interest. Uh, the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts did not press its case. There were some interesting issues in when um, something is going on in one state and it causes problems in a second state, but the, those uh, issues were never addressed. Rohrbach sold Berkshire Power Company in 1913 to Connecticut Light and Power. The generating station here in, in Weetog um, kept going until the 1930s. When they put up the dam and power station at Falls Village, the this reservoir system was, was considered a, a backup storage. Um, in fact, there was backup storage um, all the way to Lake Garfield in, in the town of Monterey near, near us here in Great Barrington. So sad story is Robert Rohrbeck committed suicide in 1937. The next year, the Salisbury Dam ruptured. The weak west wall blew out in the hurricane of 1938. If the water is low enough in the fall, you can walk out with permission from Weetog Farm, I'm, I'm sure. Um, you, you can see some remnants of, of it across the river. That's my story, or my two stories. Um, well, if people have questions, I think you could put them in the chat box or probably um, orderly uh, one at a time, please. Uh, unmute yourself and I think you can address a question directly to Bernie. I know at least one or two of you have questions, so please feel free to go ahead. Why don't we start with Andrew? It's not a question, it's a short, very short explanation, if you'd like, from an amateur about the difference between alternating and direct current. Does anybody want to hear that? Sure. Okay, direct current travels in a straight line, as it were. The current stays at a constant amount. Alternating current goes up and down in a cycle way, like a sine wave, and that allows it to use a transformer. In order, a transformer to change voltage has to have a change in the current going in, up and down. If DC goes into a transformer, nothing happens. So you cannot increase or decrease DC uh, voltage, which is what you want to do when you're transmitting it, because it doesn't work in transformers, but alternating, you can have a very high voltage coming to a transformer at your pole, and that will be able to be reduced to a current you can use in your house. Clear as mud, I know. Stanley once joked that to send direct current a mile, you'd need a wire as, as thick as um, his, his thigh. Um, Probably true. A few, you know, after this hubbub was over, Stanley met Edison and Stanley confided, Edison said, you were right. <laughs> well, I think Edison was enamored of DC because it seemed to be safer. It was harder to get electrocuted with DC and I'm not sure why. He, he did some dramatic uh, demonstration of that apparently. Um, where AC, it's easier to get electrocuted, but it doesn't go far. And this, so uh, yeah, one of um, another great Barrington man, Frank Pope, who worked with Westinghouse, um, owned what's now the Wainwright Inn on, on South Main Street in Great Barrington. He had a, a setup and he had a, a little transformer in his basement and he died in a, he, I can't say he, he he wouldn't, they wouldn't say he was electrocuted, but during a, a rainstorm, he went in the basement to check his system 
and he was stood in a puddle of water and, and somehow he got a shock and he fell backwards and struck his head and died as a result. Um, I'm sure that uh, incidents like that were always uh, fodder for the Edison interest at that time. He also, Edison also had a pretty good investment already in direct, his direct current um, products. So he didn't want to switch and have to start all over again. Does anybody want to hear a, a story about alternating current um, being timed for electric clocks? I'm from Ashland, Massachusetts. Yes, um, go ahead. Originally. And um, Henry Warren invented the electric clock, but it didn't keep good time on direct current. So he talked Boston Edison into timing the alternating cycles to run the electric clocks on time. So there's a master clock supposedly in Boston that keeps the time and uh, controls the alteration uh, alter, alternation. Hey. That, that's my story. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, yes, Henry Warren, is... sorry, Henry Warren's company was called the Warren Clock Factory, became Telecron in Ashland, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and uh, later on, uh, General Electric, the clock and timer department. Andrew, you want to say something else? Sure. Yes, it was very interesting, Mr. Drew. Thank you very much. And you're a little bit modest. My brother said he saw the movie Current Wars and that you were mentioned in it. I haven't seen it, but I'm going to see it now. <laughs> um, in the credits, I have to look again. <laughs> I don't know. He, I sent him uh, the link or the, the announcement about the course yeah. so he could look at it. I, he couldn't do it today, but he said he saw the movie. Well, they're interesting actors in it, but uh, it ain't quite the right, you know, it, it ain't quite there. Hollywood. Yeah, right. Uh, can I can I add that the, the Stanley family, I believe uh, William's brother or was involved in the steam uh, automobile, the Stanley? Um, no, not a brother, uh, another branch of the family. One of William's William Stanley's, one of his sons became the Stanley of Morgan Stanley. Okay. So that um, generation was more savvy with, with financial matters. Poor William, <laughs> eh, <laughs> not so much. Now, if you drive, I, I go to Lime Rock a lot and, and take different routes home and driving through Weetog uh, along the river, I noticed a, a abutment to the right across the river and I had assumed it was a, a trolley uh, bridge abutment, but maybe this is the, the dam abutment over there? Um, I have a picture, but I can't find it. <laughs> if you could see it, it's probably the, tr the train abutment. The, the dam itself, you know, it's is, um, several hundred yards down the road, away from the road. There's a, a field in between and, and trees growing. Um, and I don't know if you could even get in from the Canaan side. Uh, when I went looking once, I, all I found was subdivisions. So I, the uh, Weetog si side is much more pleasant, especially as you get to the, the state line. It's like going into a primeval uh, glen. You know, the old yes, tree. It's like going back in time. Yeah. Well, thank you. For, thank you all for turning out. Any, any last questions? All right, well, to echo Bernard, thank you all for turning out and coming. And, thank you. Uh, I hope you all learned something. Thanks. Have a good one, Bernie. Thank you.